But 2 Corinthians assumes much doctrine. I'm supposed to teach the text, and that usually means teach doctrine, but in this case, 2 Corinthians assumes a lot of doctrine. It's unlike any epistle. 2 Corinthians rebukes wrong thinking, yes, and in hopes to restore Christian fellowship, but in the process, it does allude to a lot of truths we need to know. Ron mentioned that a straight-through reading of 2 Corinthians takes about 30 to 40 minutes. It takes me a lot longer. I'll tell you why. Just like when I, the few times I've had to advance the slides, like two or three years ago was the first time, the song slides, I would start focusing on the meaning of the words I'm looking at and forget, oh yeah, the whole congregation wants me to advance the slides. It's not good for me to spend time with the text just in straight reading through. It doesn't work for me. So I like to use a phone app and let the text uh, speak to me. Then I can audibly hear it. That works for me. At least in a book like this, it's very different. You'll notice that there are a lot of portions subdivided by the chapters. Uh, the chap a lot of chapters, 13 chapters, subdivided by 39 portions. This is not a letter of mere instruction. And not necessarily. And Paul's words often allude to a lot of issues. He might have a sentence or two that means more than just the one thing people think he's talking about. So the time that is needed is greater for the blessing intended. To talk about how he words it this way, and he's thinking this, and he knows that they're thinking this, and then converting it to a, a reworded understanding of us to, for us today, that's the joy of study. I've had that joy. This class is the product of, of my study, but let it be a springboard for yours as you toggle between the two. It could take probably 40 minutes to accurately uh, explain the background and meaning for each portion, and there are 39 portions in this study today. So just wanted to let you know there's a lot that goes into this text and this class, but I hope that you appreciate it. I need to let you know that I have a tremendous respect for this book right here. Well, the book. This is a book. I have a tremendous respect for the inspiration of God's word conveyed to us. Of course, in different languages originally that we don't even speak. So I highly appreciate those who are well studied in academia and languages to translate this book into a language we understand. I highly appreciate accurate translation. Whatever wording is true to the meaning of the original words and conveys to a listener the original message and intent, then that is a translation that is good. And what I am doing today obviously is not a translation. Now, certainly my own word studies and my, you know, my own study time has been invested for the work that's been done. But I don't want you to look at what I am sharing with you today as a translation but not by any means, nor do I want you to look at it as a, a devotional summary. It's not a devotional summary, nor is it a commentary. Now, there are some parenthetical allusions, but it's not really a commentary either. I don't want you to look at what I do as more clever than the inspired thoughts that God led, the Spirit led Paul to make. Just want to let you know all of that, because uh, I revere the word as well. But the challenge in a class like this to only deal with the text, no application, that's Lucian's work next week, but to just deal with the text in a book that doesn't teach doctrine, per se, but assumes a lot of doctrine, it has to be this way. At least this is the way I feel it has to be. And I'm thankful, I'm actually pleased that it's, uh, it was an idea that, that uh, came to fruition. And I hope that you are blessed by it. But the challenge of rewording inspired text in a book like this is to never change the meaning. Keep it potent and never change the meaning. Stay on topic, keep it simple. It's actually harder for me to keep it simple. Yeah, fewer words, make it potent. Uh, it takes a lot longer and harder to make it simple. And this, hopefully, is the result of that. But this class is the product of my study. Hope it will be a springboard for yours. How do we want to do this? Well. Let's just say on the video, you go back to minute number eight or nine and are joining us again after it's recorded live. Hello again. We're going to look at the text together as you read the text and then push play or uh, unpause, I guess, uh, on the video reading the portions that we've got. 
I know the prints are small for you, so it might be easier to hear than, than to uh, read that small text on just two sheets of paper. But it's there for you. And we can read the text. We can uh, hear my words again after a little bit of studied rewording. And just to see if it helps us understand more and appreciate more what Paul's intent is in writing and also true to the tone in which he's writing. Now, at the end of uh, this class, these notes that I've printed will not be covered in tears, but I want you to imagine Paul's uh, manuscript uh, papyrus covered in tears. Uh, we said before, 1 Corinthians was not easy to study through. It is not easy or pleasurable to read unless you want to relate to Paul, per se, because it wasn't fun for even Paul to write. But 2 Corinthians is very, very similar in that way. It's not easy. It's not meant for leisure reading. It, it's deep. It's rich. It's heartfelt. And, and I hope you find my alternate version uh, a blessing to you. But first, uh, as we teach a little bit more, that what's the purpose of 2 Corinthians? It is to defend Paul's apostleship for the gospel's sake. Uh, false teachers, uh, whew, false teachers had won a following there in Corinth chapter 11. And false teachers were undermining Paul's authority and the church's confidence in him. Let me just ask you, how do you feel after working your hardest for something virtuous to only bless another only to have people lie about you and persuade those who once trusted you to now think evil of you. That's the nature of evil wanting to conquer good. And, of course, it won't in the end. But 2 Corinthians is an intensely personal letter in which Paul boldly defends his calling. 2 Corinthians is rich. It is, it is heartfelt in his admonition because it was somberly written to, there it is, defend his apostleship only for the gospel's sake. Paul prefers to talk about Christ, and he does a lot, but, but the lies that people have shared about him and are being believed about him, uh, they are threatening the very practice of faith by these people who he brought to the faith, so he cares about them like a father would his children. So Paul writes a very difficult letter while alluding to several experiences in his teachings that are not in the text, but with Ron's background study, it helps us see that there's a lot of rich shared history. He is reminding the brethren that he lovingly has shared God's whole truth with them. He hasn't held anything back. He's reminding them that they know enough to discern truth from error. They know this stuff. They need to be reminded about it, but they know it. They need to let those facts sift in their discernment. And they are, he's reminding them that thereby purge their mind from the deadly lie, threatening their experience of every blessing of life and fellowship that Christ died to provide. He has a, a lot of purposes for this letter, and so he writes it. Considering the history, with the God it, Maybe some would say the allowance of the Spirit to safely employ a very daring method, but with the Spirit, it's right on target. He is, a, of course, a sarcastic method. Uh, to expose the foolishness of the sin of those who exalt themselves, and he is going to reveal the proper spirit of, spirit of Christian living. And that's where the application comes in. Be listening in preparation for Luke, uh, Luke's class. How he reveals the Spirit of Christian living in this letter. The Holy Spirit allows Paul and guides Paul to assume a surface tone of humble sarcasm beneath the mock arrogance. He's not really arrogant, but he's pretending to be. Beneath that mock arrogance is a bruised heart, begging and pleading for a type of reconciliation, first to God and then to themselves. And it's been said that the sentiment expressed in 2 Corinthians is likened to Jeremiah. And when I heard or read that recently, I, I was reminded, I said, that makes sense. It links it up for me. I've always loved Jeremiah and his spirit. Uh, he's the one who cried, who begged, who pleaded, who even yelled and wept over Israel to think right, get right, and do right. 
so that you can enjoy the blessings and, and praise God as his redeemed family together. That makes sense. That's Jeremiah's spirit for sure in this one. Just very similar. The main message of the book, it is a plea of a faithful mentor, a faithful father whose spiritual children have been wrongly led to mistrust him. What is he accused of? <laughs> Everything that you can imagine. To those who oppose Christ and Paul, they are looking at Paul and trying to make people believe that he is accused of fickleness and carnality, withholding information, can you believe that? Self-commendation, sure that was for the Jews, uh, of being beside himself, talk, uh, taking advantage of the people, and even being suspect as to whether Christ was speaking through him or not. Paul is compelled to assume a posture of defense for the gospel's sake. And in so doing, he reveals a lot about the nature of genuine gospel ministry and in talking about what you really suffer for the cause of Christ let's see if those people are suffering in the same way I doubt it the sheer contrast of character between him and the false teachers proves that there is no contest between which ones are both teaching and living the authentic gospel it's hard to find a key verse in this whole book but Based on everything we've said, I like 2 Corinthians 4, 5. I think it sums it up well. This is what it's all about. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. That's it. That's the spirit of 2 Corinthians, and I hope you have fun over these next few moments going through the text with me. Feel free to have your Bible open. 2 Corinthians, portion by portion. It might help you that way. Uh, if, you could, if you can hear that little voice in your head while still processing the new words that I'm saying, that works. For some people, they say, I like to read the text later and listen to what you say. Uh, that, that works. That would probably work for me too. But if you've already read the text, you're familiar with it, that gives you an advantage. If you haven't, today's class gives you an advantage. But make use of that time. You're here. Let's get the blessing from it. Now, I've already told you, my notes are not a translation my notes are not a commentary or a devotional summary but study goes into making sure that through my eyes you're hearing the book hopefully accurately there are some allusions that may not be referenced in word and you think why did Michael skip that or, or did he skip that sometimes I don't know based on the travels that he made and the letters that he wrote which one was he talking about uh, was that Acts chapter 12 or chapter 19 stuff like that Still some study to do. So once I start and assume a posture, I want to bless you in this class by making you feel like you're listening to Paul. And as you're listening to Paul, through my interpretation, I guess, my, my experience of his writing, I just uh, want to ask you, which group are you in? Which of the two groups are you in? Are you in the group that loves the Lord and knows truth? can spot the liars, the Judaizers? Or are you persuaded by them to doubt Paul? Which group are you in as we read this letter? <clears throat> portion by portion. Conceptual concepts re-expressed is a good term there. Greetings. You are about to read this letter that I, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, have written. It's pretty clear from the start. <laughs> May the brethren be blessed by our Father God's grace and peace. The faithful will suffer affliction. Praise God for his care and comfort, which helps us minister to others in need of the same strength he gives us. Many of you need consolation. I know I certainly do. As brethren, we will help each other. Good tone there. Thanks for, your, thanks for your prayers. They work. God spared our lives from the trouble we encountered in Asia. We felt like dying and thought we would. But God delivered us to keep blessing many. No matter what others say, my conscience is at peace to know that I have conducted myself humbly 
and sincerely with you. I did not seek attention, but focused fully on God's grace. And even in writing, we are consistent in all we told you. And now, as you've matured and are maturing, our bond as brethren is stronger and more deeply cherished than the day you were baptized into Christ. As sure as God's promises to his children are faithful, I genuinely intended to travel to you and enjoy that blessing of enriched fellowship. After all, it is the one spirit of God we all have partaken of, which proves we are established in Christ. Why did I delay my visit? God knows this is the hard truth. I only want my presence to bless you. But countering the lies believed about me is not only very painful, it's not helpful for you to see or witness. I gain no pleasure from doing anything that would hurt you. Chapter 2. I felt that writing a letter would be best for now, and it was. Hoping it would even help our next visit be more joyful. And yet I know it was a hard letter to read. My soul was obviously deeply grieved. Please accept all I said as evidence of how deeply I love you. Verses 5 and following. I appreciate your efforts to exercise church discipline to those I called out. Anyone who offended me <laughs> as a member and an apostle has in a way offended the entire body. I know it's difficult to discipline a spiritual sibling. The goal is to bring about repentance. But that's when the punishment of withheld blessing stops. It's for restoration. Let it never be for retribution. We know how Satan works to destroy the body. As difficult as it is for you, you must now forgive and receive that sibling again. Let the body be blessed and the penitent soul not be overtaken by the excessive sorrow of unjust rejection. If you're obedient in all things, you will do this as well. But not just for me, because of Christ. Just as I forgive many things for the sake of unity in Christ, I also, I will also forgive anyone you have so forgiven. I remember when I was preaching in Troad. It was a great opportunity and, and joy to spread the gospel throughout Macedonia. And yet my soul was so concerned for all of you that I could not rest. But praise God through Christ, who supplies us with all we need to not just persevere, but to march in triumphant victory. Our work is being blessed because God sees our sincere devotion to his gospel. While others try denying or manipulating it for selfish gain. It is our living testimony that attracts many who also desire his victory over sin and death. Chapter 3. Think of the victory that you still experience in your preaching, he gets personal here, and I love how he does this. What's my evidence for being an apostle? You! Is your life, new life in Christ, not authentic? Everyone can see that it is. Not like those fraudulent lives or letters that some are using to endorse themselves to appear credible. Those fake statements on paper can't provide what everyone sees that God himself has already written on your heart and reveals by your conduct. So, your Christian life testifies of my apostleship. Do you struggle feeling inadequate? Do you think I struggle with arrogance? We all must boast only in Christ who qualifies 
and establishes us. Not by the letter of the law that kills, <laughs> but by his spirit of life. The Judaizers are the letters of the phrase is such an interesting connection. There. On that note, let's consider that former covenant through Moses, which the Judaizers are still advocating. Even though it only brings death by knowledge of sin, being from God, it had its glory for its time. So how much more glorious is a covenant of grace that empowers the redeemed to live his righteousness? This truth justifies our greater boldness. Moses knew that this covenant was divine, given for a limited time. Ironically and tragically, many Jews still don't see that it has already served its time. Only by an honest look at Christ can one clearly see the greater glory in the covenant of liberty. The old has been fulfilled in death for sin. The new can give liberty and life. Not only do we clearly see his glory in Christ, but we notice his transforming power helping us increasingly reflect it. Wow. Chapter 4. This purpose is our passion. It keeps us going. Therefore, we reject doing all shameful things. We reject doing all shameful things. Like perverting the gospel or deceiving people for selfish gain. Who's he talking about? Sound familiar? Instead, it's our sincere conduct, verses, the second half of verse 2, it's our sincere conduct that gives us both a clean conscience and confidence. Since we preach the saving light of Christ in a world of darkness, those who reject the light will stay blinded to truth and remain lost. Yes, we are messengers of divine truth. But we are merely human. This is an interesting connection for us. I tried to compare it to like old, rugged, common use luggage. But being used to transport a king's treasure. I compared it to that. The glory is God's. Not because of who we are as much as what he has given us. So we strive to bless others with it. Frankly, by living, by, uh, frankly, living by the light of truth in a dark world proves challenging. And yet we remain loyal to Christ in daily sacrifice. So we prevail. The blessings are for all who believe, and glory will be shared among all upon his return. This promise keeps our spirits joyous and focused, even amid earthly hardship and physical decline. This world is temporary. Heaven is eternal. Our bodies, I'm a tent maker, you know. Our bodies are like tents, temporary. We will dwell, dwell in them for only a little time, a limited time, but in the house of God, the house God has prepared for our soul, we will dwell eternally. Since death in Christ is not loss, but gain, I know we want that habitation now. The spirit we all share, which he deposited in our souls, is proof that we are ready for that day. This judgment appointment certainly motivates godly living so that we are always pleasing to him God knows that our hearts intent in preaching is that souls may be ready for that day I trust that you truly know that as well I don't applaud myself but you can justly honor me in defense when another falsely accuses me for our efforts to help you 
we suffer ridicule by others who seek the very glory for themselves they accuse us of wanting. But we are humbled by the fact that Christ died to save us all. So we die to ourselves to live for him. Our entire ministry is to reconcile people to God who brings life and unity to the body. So what are the marks of true ministry? The gospel of salvation is here. Let it bless you. We are living by it faithfully to honor God and ensure as, as many as possible are blessed by it. However, as genuine ministers of God, we are suffering from much, from much affliction and opposition. And it was hard to abbreviate everything because look at what all he's going through. Several ordeals, misfortunes, burdens, losses, beatings, arrests, unjust imprisonments, intense commotions, hunger and exhaustion, yet sleepless nights. The sin-loving world sees us as poor, weak, pitiable, deceivers, shameful nobodies who lie to start riots for fame. That's how they see us. Only by devotion to God's virtuous spirit do we persevere, knowing who we truly are. My brethren in Corinth, my children in the faith, you know who we are. We are not withholding any blessing from you, but you are allowing yourself to be misguided and deprived. Don't respond to my sincerity with stiffness. Rather, be equally open in spiritual affection. Don't let those who are not of Christ taint your view of and ruin your relationship with those who are mutually in Christ. Since God is dwelling with you, don't identify yourself with the world. Don't be like them. Be holy like God. Chapter 7. In defending myself, I am not condemning you for misjudging me of wrongdoing. Paul knows how they would think. Knowing that we share trials in Christ, I actually love and boast of you as family. When entering Macedonia, my body was so weary and my soul was so troubled. But seeing Titus return from you and hearing his report of your devotion to Christ and concern for me made me rejoice. God supplies that need. I struggled to write a letter I knew would make you mourn. But yet again, I suffered the pain of rebuking you to quickly bring many closer to Christ. Just another blessing I did not withhold from you. Titus remains deeply grateful for you, for how you encouraged him. So am I. Titus genuinely praises you. So do I. Oh, the joy of fellowship in the Lord. <laughs> I'll use that word fellowship. I'm not transition here to bring up a few other matters. Chapter 8. Those baptized in Macedonia were so thrilled by the gospel that elated by the liberties from being part of this heavenly family that though poor they willingly sacrificially gave funds to help fellow believers of course we primarily rejoice that they gave themselves to Christ but notice how their love prompted a type of gift to enjoy a fellowship with fellow members of this liberated body they were added to. Titus was sent to encourage your growth in all things, including this grace of giving for fellowship and blessing. I'm not commanding you in this. He knows the accusations. I'm not commanding you in this, but I am writing you, no, no, I mean, I am wanting you to compare yourself in this. Look at them. Look at yourself. As much as the converts in Macedonia began exemplifying the spirit of Christ by their sacrifice and love for one another, 
Are you likewise continuing in that example? Are you both responsibly managing and generously giving of what you have, showing your love to all the brethren to help any in need? This love for one another is God's will to ensure that each member is taken care of. Careful to be above reproach, ensuring that their gift was properly used and to bless the body and to God's glory, we entrusted it, the contribution, to both Titus and the reputable brother the congregation rep, uh, recommended. It wasn't for me. Chapter 9. I've bragged to them about your willingness to give. The brethren I sent for collection was not because I doubted or questioned your desire, but to enable you with the opportunity to follow through. Now's the time. Think of how embarrassing it would be to us, to us both, if, after boasting of your willingness to help, there is none when needed. It's wise, then, to plan early and be punctual for such matters of importance. Besides, giving so cheerfully to the brethren helps strengthen and grow God's kingdom. Think of it like sowing seeds, spiritual seeds, that yield a harvest of eternal blessing for all involved. As you mature in giving, others develop trust in God, who provided through you. You became an example for them, as the world sees the example of us all. So, never stop being a blessing, or never stop blessing others cheerfully. We trust in God who also cheerfully multiplies resources, increases opportunities, and completely provides for us. I hope that's true to the intent of the context. God's a cheerful giver. Be like him. Praise God for his indescribable or inexpressible generous gift. We're talking about money over here? No, we're talking about God's gift. Think about that and be like that. Let it show. Chapter 10. Brethren, I know that while I'm there, I will have to boldly rebuke some who think evil of me. I pray I don't have to treat you like that. <laughs> this carnal world wages war on us. But we are victorious because our weapons are spiritual, infused with God's very power. For example, love conquers hate. Sound reason can destroy rumors. His truth kills lies and triumph over man's pride. No one has defense against our obedience. And that's the key. No one has defense against our obedience, our lives. Some are mocking the contrast of my boldness in writing and my meekness in presence. To the world, they would see that as, well, everything he's accused of. Far from accused hypocrisy, challenge them in this to observe my consistency in what I preach and what I practice. Boom. Good job, Paul. Spot on. Spirit inspired, of course. While I've validated my apostleship to lead you to salvation, others are pretending to be apostles to lead you to destruction. Unlike those who are foolishly comparing themselves by themselves to boast only in their own accomplishments, we are grateful and humbled by our God-given role. Yes, we're apostles given from God. Who's God? Think about him. We know its limits. We know this role's privileges and responsibilities. Our hope is your salvation. Our joy is your growth. Our enduring mission is the expansion of his kingdom. Those who glory in themselves won't be approved by God. They're not in his hands. That was a fun chapter to read. Wow. Chapter 11. You know I love you. Would you tolerate me to pretend being as foolish as those who promote themselves? Since such speech has led so many astray, it seems you've done more than tolerate those who speak this way. Ouch. 
but that's good. That's good stuff. I may not have the eloquent speech of these self-proclaimed super apostles, but I've already manifested my super superior, I should say, superior credentials or abilities to you. Ask yourself, unlike them, did I take any money from you to preach what blessed you? Other congregations willingly burden themselves to support my work for you. That's the key. My boasting in this is superior to theirs. Let them follow in my example to boast like me. <laughs> but they can't. They won't. They, like their master Satan, can only appear to be righteous, but will deserve their destruction. Permit me a little longer to play the fool by boasting in the flesh. All right, just like those you've allowed to again enslave you by denying God's grace, i.e. Galatians, remember? You felt wise to listen to them, but wisdom would have boldly rejected them on the spot. I added that. They boast as descendants of Abraham? Okay, so can I. They boast as ministers? Are they really serving Christ like I am? Should they, should we see how their ministry trials or ministerial trials and sufferings pair up to mine? Okay, let's see this. What about their care for the brethren? Are they heartbroken when any church member is wounded or led astray? I doubt they can boast in these things that I could. But again, it's unbecoming for any Christian to boast. When a garrison of soldiers sought to arrest me in Damascus, I escaped by being lowered out a window hiding in a basket. Yeah, praise God for how he works and keeps us humble. Chapter 12. They also boast of knowledge. I also can boast about being directly taught by the Lord. They claim to be wise among men. I could boast of my heavenly experience of when I heard things too great for humans to speak. Yet I do not, because no one should think about me more than what I am. That's one reason God denied my request to remove this thorn in my flesh, this hindrance to function or for functioning more effectively. Uh, I, uh, so that my body's weakness, so that through my body's weakness, the strength of the gospel can be more clearly seen. I'll preach on that this morning a tad. Against these false prophets, I've played the fool by boasting to you of my superior credentials, but with all the validating signs you've seen and blessings you've experienced by my work, you ought to have boasted about me to them. Think about the proverb, let another man's lips praise thee. Isn't that, that's right. But I guess, oh, this hurts. But I guess you lost confidence in me by my one mistake, to not rob you like they are. Wow. Just to let you know, your copied sheet was produced by my notes. Copy, paste, copy, paste. You do that 39 times. What happened? Uh, there's likely a repasting of the portion I just spoke from my notes highlighted fields did not copy, so it was duplicated. If you want what I'm about to read, verses 14 through 21, it goes a little something like this. After him just saying, I'm not robbing you like they are, he says, or my interpretation of what he says, I'm ready to make a third visit, but don't worry, I won't burden you. <laughs> I'm not really going to do that. You were like my children. Rather than take your money, I desire to sacrifice for you that you may enjoy spiritual treasure. I know what some think, that I did not send Titus to our, and our good brother to you to collect for those in Jerusalem. Ask yourself, have any of us ever deceived you? Have any of us ever taken advantage of you? Have we ever excused ourselves from li uh, living like we teach others to live? We're not the exception. When I come to you, I hope to see that you are living as you should. Chapter 13, otherwise, oh boy, the very unrepentant souls who desire to see a bold demonstration of Christ speaking through me will be the very ones I direct it towards. 
just as Christ's body was crucified, yet quickened to life by God's power, we may be weak in Christ, physically speaking, but yet His Spirit gives us power that you can see. Ask yourself, are you living by the power of His Spirit? If not, you are disqualified. But I trust that you will see that we are not disqualified. Don't misunderstand. I don't want you to do evil to make our good evident. No. I want you to live honorably. I want you to be complete in Christ. And I hope this letter helps you do that. Be comforted, be united, be peaceable, gracious to all, abounding in the love and the fellowship of God. I have thoroughly enjoyed studying 2 Corinthians to the degree that this class has been produced. And I hope that it's blessed you. Again, I hope this is a springboard for you to study the text to prepare you for the application and all application of Christian living that Lucian will bring up next Sunday morning. Next week, application part three. And then, of course, after that, we're quickly going through the epistles. Stay up to date on the reading of these as we go through. You have a three-week portion of time to read it at least once together, ideally, ideally 